Um, yeah, so I basically want to talk about um, failure in Wikipedia. I started thinking about this. Um, I, I probably should just give a small introduction. My name is Nupur and I live and study in New Delhi, India. I am a Wikipedia contributor. I have worked with the Wikimedia Foundation and with a non-profit organization in India that is also funded by the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, so I have basically worked in the Indian context with Wikipedia activities and that's partially what I'm going to talk about. Um, both as a Wikipedia contributor and as a contractor with the foundation, I sort of started understanding how community building works and especially in technology and tech cultures. And I saw that a bunch of things went right and a bunch of things didn't. But I guess my, my basic trouble or my war was always with the encyclopedia as such or with the way things work. So it's, it's like saying that uh, if there was an initiative like gender gap where you basically work to get more women involved, I wasn't quite convinced if that was the way to go forth and get more women in. So I started thinking at a much basic level and then it's always I think a Wikipedian's sort of dream thing or whatever, an experiment, right? Like, okay, so now you see that this can go right or this should be done this way. So I started doing a bunch of experiments with editing and then I landed in a couple of fights. So I also, <laughs> so I'd probably just show you a bunch of articles that I wrote and, and how I wrote them very deliberately, very consciously. And I almost quoted those controversies and wanted to have a meaningful conversation with those, with the people who exist on the encyclopedia. So the whole intent was to say that you can't just get away with saying that Wikipedia is a young white male space, but you've got to go up there and then confront some of them and find out what they really have to say and say what you have to say and start a dialogue there. And that's why I think that calling it a failure in the positive sense is pretty awesome because what you really want is that that Wikipedia is not open anymore. I don't think it's open. I don't think it's it's what all that it started out as and nothing remains like that because everything solidifies after a point, right? Everything that becomes bigger needs to go by rules and then has hierarchies and has people governing it and everything. So it's really hard for someone to break in, which almost everybody in the community acknowledges. But yeah, so I'm just going to recount a bunch of experiences. Please feel free to stop me anywhere and chip in with your own experiences. That would be great. Um, but I'm going to start with a completely non-tech and absolutely philosophical perspective on it. I'm not sure if you've heard of this guy called Bruno Latour, but Latour writes on media and technology, theory and cultures. And he's written this thing called technology and morality, or sort of always figuring out the war between social sciences and technology or where the social configures in the technological. So I think I heard in the morning someone saying, you know, or probably on the first day when someone said that uh, you can't just write awesome code, you need to also keep in mind that you're writing it for somebody. So you can't just put awesome products there and hope that someone uses them, but you've really got to speak with people who want to use them. And that's how you're going to develop things which are more useful and not just good looking or awesome. So yeah, what Latu writes about this little process, which I like to call the political in the tech, which I think almost nobody's talked about in the whole conference is, and that's where a person from humanities and social sciences gets really worried, is that uh, you need to make detours. He explains this very simply, saying that if you wanted to go and open a bank account, it's not as simple as opening a bank account. So if you think that opening a bank account or, or having an open source project and contributing to it is a good thing. You have your primary task as a good thing, but there's a bunch of activities that you need to do before you can start contributing or have a bank account. So for example, you probably need a social security number, you need this, that, you need to go sign somewhere. So you need to engage in conversations with the government, with the bank, with people who may not necessarily agree with your line of thought and may not be working with the same ideologies that you are. And what most often happens is that in doing something larger and good, say for example like Wikipedia, things that are in between, these little steps that we negotiate, like policies on Wikipedia, they are rendered transparent. We think that if there is a note, noteworthy notability policy of, or there's a neutrality of information policy, I just have to work around it. I just have to play by the rules if I want the article up there. 
But that's really where the struggle, I feel, begins. And that's where people get excluded. And that's where information gets colored. So yeah, he says that in order to accomplish, you know, you have to do these smaller tasks. Um, and, and what I've been doing through those experiments that I'll show in the end is really inserting this political, social and cultural back and feeling for myself or demonstrating to myself and people around me that Wikipedia is still very much alive and a place where people have dialogues as well. Um, on the other hand, it's also to look at culture that is produced in conversation with the technological and how it becomes a flat world. So what happened is, I think, um, recently when that whole American female author controversy came up, the categories, right? Yeah. Now, uh, that's what I was telling uh, somebody from the foundation as well, is that it's very frustrating to be somewhere in between. So you're at one ha a end you have feminists and the other end you have Wikipedians. And you are, you're somewhere in between. So you want to agree with both, but you can't. Because one group doesn't quite understand how Wikipedia works. And the other group doesn't understand what the whole fuss is about if it's only a categorization issue. So I felt that this, this is kind of producing a very flat world that, you know, what's the big deal? You just need to work around the policies, see how categories really work. It was a noble intent thing, blah, blah, blah. And on the other hand, there's like a conspiracy theory going on saying, you know, of course, how Wikipedians, and because I'm on the communications list, I, I think I keep reading almost four to five articles every week that conspire against, you know, how Wikipedia is so evil and filled with these men and these women who do this or that. Um, yeah, so coming to w doing Wikipedia in India, um, this is a snapshot from the Glam project, and this is from um, the Assamese Wikipedia. A Assam is a state in East Northeast India and uh, Assamese is the language and we celebrated 10 years of Wikipedia there. The encyclopedia was dead for almost 8 years like someone started it and didn't go for long and then suddenly there was a spurt and within 2 years a lot of people started contributing and I think now they're doing pretty well. Um, so what I learned from doing the Wikipedia projects in India, first comes the Glam project. Now this was like someone from uh, the US and Australia and UK was already doing things. What happens is that you go into a cultural institution and try and digitize their stuff and you try and encourage them to contribute to the open source and free knowledge culture in general. And we were trying to start a similar project in India. But I wasn't really sure if it was going to work out. So we had been lobbying with a lot of places for quite some time. And eventually a place called the Crafts Museum agreed. Um, what happened after that is very interesting is because we sort of almost went in with a rosy vision of you know having people, employees at the museum, having volunteers in a city, you know how people talk about it. If there's an open source project, everybody's going to contribute, like just tell them man, they're going to come, you know, for the love of knowledge. Well, it didn't happen in Delhi, like nobody was interested in free knowledge. They were really interested in what was going to be achieved at the end of it. Uh, what happened to the employees at the museum is that most of them had extremely low literacy levels and if so, only in their native languages. So they weren't comfortable with English. So again, we had a setback and we really had to start thinking, you know, what was going wrong. Once we got past that and we said, okay, no problem, you know, we can work with an Indian language Wikipedia. So we started working with Hindi, the language. And um, then we realized that they can't use computers, like they can't type even in English. So then we had to start using an English keyboard and then start learning Indic uh, layout on it. So start teaching people how to type in Hindi. So that was another task. Once we were done with that, we had another task which was accessibility. In the sense that you might have read and heard about how there's low internet penetration in India which is increasing. But it's really when you go in there and you realize that this person has probably never seen Google on their computer. like. A browser on their on their desktop screen and that's that's when you start explaining to them how to navigate the entire world and what to do so it was outreach at very different levels obviously quite frustrating because you don't really know where to start you don't know how far this is going to go um, but it was also a nice starting point because we I say for example I found this one photographer at the museum and he was like one of these guys who was completely self-motivated so even today after the project shut down, 
I think he's been contributing to Wikimedia Commons, the photo repository, media repository, and I think he's contributed over a thousand images just on his own. Like he learned how to upload an image, how to categorize, and he just kept following that same procedure again and again and again, which was pretty cool. The, also the more interesting part was the licensing and open source part of it, which is to say that obviously Wikimedia is not in isolation, so we would have things about what is Creative Commons and why should you put your data out for free and things like that. So it's literally, if I could visualize the whole thing for you is, you know, having to put in information in a pipe and then the new stakeholders that emerge out of the whole process. Like one may never imagine that you would have to interact with government officials and their um, proficiency on all of these parameters and then other people. And that's really, I feel, how outreach worked out for us. So it was, it was like there wasn't a tech community as such and you were building one, you are sowing seeds for probably what could come later. Um, and that's where you start imagining and I think that's why the program we were working on didn't quite work out is because we had all the documentation and everything ready from the earlier lessons mostly implemented in North America. So that's, that's really incomparable. Even if you go to schools where kids and adults uh, are in, in, a, in a more similar environment, the gap is just so much. And it's not like people can't learn, but the learning curve is very different. Another thing I, I was exploring this at the Digital Media Learning Conference is badges. I think Mozilla Foundation sponsors a badge-based learning program. So where students get badges for doing X number of activities. Personally, I find it very retarded. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the conference they did, they had a bunch of awards which are similar to badges, but I, I don't know if, um, although I think Ford Foundation or one of those along with the MacArthur Foundation and Mozilla together do administer physical badges to school students in the US. So yeah, that was the other instance. I thought there was, yeah, really, really, you know, something very inferior about it, like giving badges because what it does is really takes out the, the sense of morality, the sense of incentive-less right doing, which just goes away. And it did, yeah. No, and, and then the swag just, just destroyed everything because we used to have meetups and people literally just turned up for those badges or whatever. And, you know, we had like bunches of email addresses and they weren't responding after a meetup because all they came for was, and in fact, like I'm not criticizing, but Mozilla reps, the, yeah, those guys in India are literally doing the same thing right now. They hold these fancy meetups and they give out badges and stickers and stuff. And people literally come there for that. Like they don't care after that, which is very sad because I don't think that's how it should be done. Yeah, Josh. Well, Yeah, I think in the longer programs, so for example, if you have an ambassador program, if you have an education program which runs for a good two, three months and students are doing a bunch of tasks, I'm not completely opposed to giving incentives, but the way this turned out was, you know, like freeloaders gathering at a place and just mooching off and then taking off. So the, the whole point of conceiving meetups, regular meetups, was that people come on their own because they want to talk about something or learn something rather than you know giving away badges or looking at who's coming or who's not often it also happens that you you know that some famous FOSS guys are coming in so they only come there so that they can strike up a conversation with the FOSS guys so the project really suffers because that kind of embodying of the goals doesn't happen um, then this question came up is that we completely revamped we started you know, thinking the foundations of what we were doing. And we wondered whether the idea of building these new communities, you know, getting people who haven't done this 
before, getting them to do it now, does that really work? Or are we doing something completely stupid and not fruitful? So then we thought, okay, yeah, we should probably go back to communities that already exist and probably match one of our parameters, say for example, people in universities or high schools or people who already know how to type in Indian languages and let's try and do this with them. Though some of those experiments are still going on, although I'm not a part of those, but I don't know how that pans out. If you have any feedback, it would be lovely to hear. And then, of course, this is like an open-ended question, you know, how do you explain open and free? That's, that's also ridiculous because we would go in very, yeah, with a swagger and say free as in not free beer, but free speech. And nobody really got the point, like, you know, so the, the depth and seriousness and gravity of what you do in an open source or free knowledge project really needs to be reconceived, rethought of, and how do we convey it to people? Um, yeah, so our goal was pretty crass and obvious to increase the number of editors and like no matter how, just do it. And the result was that people are yet to be Wikipedia worthy in the sense that the kind of contributors that we imagine would jump in and start contributing are probably yet to be born or yet to be cultivated in that particular territory. So <laughs> it's really a different kind of environment. What I mean is that uh, when we went in, say for example, and hoped to do an education program, the documentation and everything that we carried, the photographs, the images we had, had in mind, the results we expected, like teaching them this and they would automatically start doing this, the unanticipated copy wires that landed up, is to say that that kind of culture, the open and free wide should be done. All of that prep had to be done before. So Wikipedia is in that sense a very high literacy medium and that you need to actually have a preparation around it before you can start just getting people to edit. So I wasn't a part of the education program, but they did collaborate with the universities and train the teachers in advance. Exactly, yeah. That also brings us to how there's a huge gap between education and technology as such. So people who are in education are not necessarily oriented towards technology and that too in open source. So probably that's the, so that's the whole Wikipedia worthy and that's why I put it in quotes saying that it's rather ironic. Um, yeah, so then um, you should definitely check out this book called CPOV, Critical Point of View, um, which came out of this conference that we had in Bangalore, India, um, organized by the Institute of Network Cultures and CIS um, and edited by Hirt Lovink. Uh, in that, there is an essay, there are wonderful essays by a lot of people who are in the Wikipedia community and outside. But there's this guy called Lawrence Liang, and he's also a theorist from India and he's written this history of encyclopedias in pre-digital mediums and, and not necessarily just encyclopedia but all kinds of media and how information used to travel through it and so on and, and that's where he says that we imagine encyclopedias and we imagine who's going to use them but it fundamentally changes when it comes to the digital medium because we don't know who our end consumer is so even in terms of product design, I think it is a very important lesson that you get because one really at some point starts limiting, starts thinking and that's where the openness goes away because you feel that everybody who doesn't fit or is, is not being productive in that sense is being destructive or is being an aberration. No, we are just realizing in the sense that we said that, okay, if we need a hundred editors, so where are we going to go and get them? So we went to schools and universities and then we uh, charted out a process like how, how are we going to prepare them to contribute and all of that. So at the end of that whole process, we expected hundred editors and that didn't happen. Maybe even ten didn't happen. So there was some serious gap there. Um, and that is why I think Failing is not at all a bad term. There is another theorist that you should definitely look up called Judith Halberstam. 
um, who is a queer theorist and um, talks about failure in a very productive sense, in the sense that it totally makes you reimagine, rethink what you're really trying to, to do and what your success measures are. Because once we set those success measures and goals, we, we just start measuring ourselves against those. And we completely forget the whole self-reflexive, critical thinking part of it. Because then we are in the process of convincing people, selling our product to them and so on and so forth. And, and the whole, again, the whole part about um, gender gap or diversity and all of that becomes pretty much a marketing talk or a sham. If you're just going to really put welcome banners and, you know, give out some swag or make some kind of uh, concessions for people. That's not really how this is going to work. So what happened is that, you know, in fact, I've seen this happen and it has happened against me also that people resent you if you get privileges and it's pretty natural for anybody to resent you if you get privileges to be a part of a community. So it's really got to be on a level of equality. How? I, I'm still exploring, still figuring out. Um, the Again, the balancing of the tech and the social is this this pr pretty much worked for us is that then we came out of our shell and started locating group interests in the sense that if we found a bicycle cycling club then we, we would try and figure out what interests them what motivates them and wh where could we figure out in their daily time where could we fit in rather than asking them to free up a weekend for us and then come in and learn something about Wikipedia and you know do whatever we ask them to. So I think that works pretty well if you try and go the other way around. Yeah, so now these are the three, exp I, I mean I keep doing a lot of stuff but these were particularly interesting to me. Um, so I, uh, as a part of my editing misadventures adventures is that I try and write about things that I feel will either be contested on Wikipedia or will never appear on Wikipedia if someone doesn't have the bright idea to put them there. Um, yeah, or and, and definitely peak at a certain level in viewership, readership on other platforms. So for example, the first one is, uh, there is this, I mean, it's pretty normal for someone to have an article on a pizza joint in the US, in, in a city or on a street or something somewhere. But this particular pizza, a joint called Jasuben Pizza is in a city of India called Ahmedabad. What happened is that the chief minister of this state, he um, went to a summit and delivered a speech. And he started giving examples of women entrepreneurs. And he suddenly just quoted this lady and her business and he said, Oh, look at her, she's done so much fabulous work. Now, if you think about it socially, it's so fascinating that the same media that can generate so much noise and be oppressive in a matter of I guess like an hour or two generated like Huffington Post articles on this particular pizza joint. So you had the origin, date, place, everything, its owner's name which even the local you know city directories or anything did not have. And I thought this was a fabulous moment to actually go and put this on a global encyclopedia and see what happens. So I have I played by the rules, I got the references, I sourced the article well and a lot of people contributed. Uh, you can go look up on Wikipedia, I haven't put the top page screenshot here. But what happened is that uh, after a while someone nominated it for deletion saying, you know of course this is not noteworthy and it's interesting how it all panned out and I also had my little ranting moment there where I said, of course you think it's not noteworthy, you know, blah blah blah. But yeah, so that was fascinating and then you look at uh, how many people are viewing the page and all of that, right? So that was one experiment. And I think it's brilliant that such moments of news, media, social, political history can actually help you leverage and put certain things that would never appear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry? It is, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I, I wanted to see how it pans out and and I knew that because the references are there and it's noteworthy enough, it shouldn't go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the second one is uh, writing about sexual assault. Uh, now because I'm a cinema student and I used to work on 
on camp and horror and cult cinema. I have particular interest in say exploitation cinema or you know B grade and C grade movies in general. So I'm also interested in the subcultures that follow around it. So I have been, say for example, I've been writing articles on sex scandals that happen in India. And that too again with referenced and sourced material and everything. Just Yeah. Yeah, like national level sex scandals, but I was surprised that they didn't, these are part of your growing up and folklore, but they sort of never appear here. And then I would have to dig up uh, archives of newspapers. And it's kind of interesting that I think before 2005, even big newspapers don't have good archives or anything. So you wouldn't find most of the articles. Online? Yeah, online. So I was working with the Times of India, so I sort of knew how they would file things and, and I think they also keep a hard copy of stuff. So I knew that I, I could eventually, but the thing is, it appears on a Google search, but the article doesn't exist. Yeah, so that was the problem. Yeah, um, not, there wasn't a cache link for every article. And sometimes uh, the internet archive doesn't necessarily have either. Yeah, it didn't, it just simply didn't. Yeah, going online, exactly. So anyway, but this one was more um, out of good faith in the sense that I thought, you know, what happened is that um, Guwahati is a city in Assam, the northeastern state, and a bunch of media professionals and other people orchestrated a gang molestation incident on a girl on a very busy street, like, like one of the main streets of Guwahati. And uh, it was... It was so bad that they orchestrated so that they could tape it and it became a national event and you know all of that and it triggered morality debates and stuff. Now what was interesting is that it's a very intimate experience because I had just come back from Assam after conducting a workshop with the Assamese guys, the photograph that I showed. And so we had just bonded and you know we were like really good friends and everything. And I thought they would naturally just come up and help me write the article but they're all, they're all males. And I wrote the article and it was in the news for so many days. And then what happened is you can, I think I've put a, yeah. So there are top page. So it was nominated for deletion. And it was nominated by the same guys who I had just met like a few days ago. And they made it a personal thing saying, you know, why this fuss? You know, like in India, rapes happen by the dozen every day. So why are you targeting our state? We just made friends with you and you fed, we fed you food and blah, blah, blah. And look at you, what you're doing. So it became a whole new dynamic altogether. But it's interesting how arguments about whether news should be reported on Wikipedia or not uh, has panned out on this particular talk page. You should probably go have a look at that. Um, but yeah. The page is still there. It is. So then somebody who is completely not in our context came in and said, she's played by the rules. The stuff exists. There's uh, references and sources. And we think it's noteworthy enough. It's also getting hits, so yeah, it exists. Hmm, I don't know, and I can't write. Otherwise, I would have tried uh, writing this article. They didn't translate it. No. I think not. I doubt it. No. Yeah. Okay, and the third one. This is rather hilarious, and I mean. Uh, because now I'm in my PhD, I'm working on religious television programming in India. So I'm just really looking out at all the crazy religious channels that have surfaced with all these uh, God men. So they're not religious figures, but they're more spiritual and you know, they give out sermons and it's like God TV, but more colorful. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, and, and they're implicated in, you know, a bunch of things like this guy, his name is Nirmal Baba. You can look up, like, this is like my baby, okay? So I've been, I made this article and I've been defending it for over eight months now. Somebody blanks it out every month. We, re we request page protection every month. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me make sure I understand. This is, this is not like the usual Wikipedia deletion where it's that and uh, so now then I went and dug up you know so they have a lot of sock puppets I reported those but then there are also these guys who maintain the Hinduism portal 
and who have this little inclination towards how it should be written and how it should be kept. So they thought that just because he sprang to limelight at one moment because of a controversy doesn't mean that his article should have a big section on that. So now they've been trying to delete that allegation and fraud section all the time. Yeah, with red links mostly. So yeah, so that was interesting because I thought, let me just, I, again, you know, there was at least 10 to 12 articles coming up on, um, on the internet about him once he got into a controversy. What he did was he had embezzled funds from people and so on and so forth. So then you had, it was very interesting to see how people who I'd never imagined would find the internet or would find him here, who are coming in and editing. So there were his devotees, right? Why? I'm because guessing. Controversies, that's our editor outreach? <laughs> Looks like. Well, it's very famous that one of the first, uh, one of the first uh, French Wikipedians, uh, who's uh, probably also at some point uh, chairman of the Royal Wikimedia Foundation, she said that Wikipedia, uh, she got that excited about that, and uh, she intentionally inserted spelling mistakes in French to get people who want to correct And it, right. <laughs> No, but so we had thought of this, you know, especially in outreach sessions, we would we wouldn't save those changes, but make those little spelling mistakes and tell people just in the live text box and you know to locate and edit them. But the India community just threw up a storm, right? Like they said, this is unethical. You can't go and. Uh, make an encyclopedia inferior just so that people come and play a game and correct it all. But yeah, well, this works. So this. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying, sorry, that people come. Yeah, in. so it it is pretty fascinating that there were these devotees who were, you know, it, it's not at a Wikipedia level, but that they were learning how to copy paste material and put it on Wikipedia. They knew how to press the edit button, contrary to our understanding that they did not. They knew how to work the talk pages. They knew how to create sock puppets. So they knew a lot of things. And then someone wrote me an email. They somehow found my email because I was still working with the foundation. And he wrote me an email and said, uh, you know, looks like that you know a lot about him, blah. You know, maybe we could pay you to write the article for him. Like, why would you have such animosity? Let's just work together. <laughs> so I said, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but yeah, that was fascinating too. Yeah, so these were these, I, I mean, I keep doing these experiments and I think this is how I, every time Wikipedia sort of crumbles that you throw things at it and then something new emerges out of it. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, so I have a yeah. question. Um, okay. definitely see uh, one thing that I thought was that uh, when when we were really stuck in the middle of that jam right where we thought there was no internet there's no English speaking people and all of that I thought that maybe as like such a big entity like the Wikimedia Foundation or even the movement can actually just withdraw and say we don't have the pressure to to get contributors right that's not we are what we're supposed to do in a place like this 
maybe we should just really be investing in getting people to learn how to type in Indian languages. Something that seems unrelated, but is a long task, long term activity. And, and so then it becomes like a Gates Foundation or something which is investing in larger long term goals. So that could be one. And, uh, and I'm sure there are a lot of partners who would love to work on something like that. And the second thing that hit me, I mean, I wasn't even saying this part about it not being open until we had a meeting where we had some members from the India chapter and uh, we, were, we were constantly trying to say, okay, so, you know, you have issues and you want us to work in a particular way, etc., etc. What, what exactly is the problem? And what they said is that, of course, everybody can come and edit, but if you want to be a part of this community, then you've got to stick around for a few years. You've got to prove to us that we should take you in. So it's not only about the editing part, but the whole community building thing. That I still haven't figured out how one gets accepted and whether that's a good thing necessarily. Yeah, so. Yeah. Not necessarily. Some of them, in fact, don't even have more than 100 edits, but they were more welcome than I was, despite me editing, say, 300, 400 edits. One, of course, could be the entry. So who brings you in or how do you come in? And whether the community, whatever perceived community, sees you as a friend or an ally or an enemy. And the second thing is, I guess, there's like a rites of passage, right? You need to do a certain number of things to gain that authenticity. Programs, yeah, definitely. That was one part of it. And the second, and this I, I would not attribute to the whole community, but there was certainly a faction saying that because I'm a girl and, you know, because they're investing in also gender gap and all of that. So I got a lot of backdoor stalking, harassment and all of that because of that. So that is also where I was unwelcome. I, I could absolutely not establish a platonic relationship with anybody in the sense that either I am an enemy or I am someone that they can you know, gossip about or I'm someone who I'm having an affair with in the community. Yeah, it's just both ways. So that I couldn't really figure out. And you did not end, end, end the team, but was there. Mm. You were in the sense, take people from the community, hire people with from, right. no. But collaborate with them. Yeah, there were people. There were definitely people who were always ready to participate in something short term. So they wouldn't want to necessarily be seen as um, friends of the India program team, but they'd work with us. Yeah. Hmm. I think also the moment was quite inopportune in the sense that you can't have a chapter and a foundation team starting out at the same moment. And then obviously invest all your resources in one. That that shows a lot. Definitely, definitely. Why it rubbed off? Yeah. But here, and that wouldn't explain why it continued even after we moved to CIS and after Hisham left. So after that, it was really inexplicable why. Yeah.
maybe the wrong words. Like, mm -hmm. It took a little bit for people to understand what you meant by that exactly, but I totally yeah. get what you mean. Not, they're not prepared. They're not yeah. ready for that opportunity. Yeah. Because they don't, they don't value the same things. They don't realize what a great opportunity is to be involved with that. But I mean, do, you, do you think that's a, like a local cultural thing, and how changeable is that? Yeah, how much of this is just dependencies to install? Like typing in yeah. languages, yeah, yeah, yeah. and how much of it is super fundamental? Yeah, yeah, that's true because um, and um, there, there's someone right. There's Achal, Achal Prabhala. He did that experiment with uh, oral citations. I don't really know what happened about that, but there's some documentation on Meta. I think you can look it up. What the problem really is that when we, especially in India. This local culture thing becomes very complicated because if you're addressing urban masses, you're talking in English, but you're not necessarily talking the same culture. So the language is something and, and what they speak at home and practice in real life is something very different and derived from more of an oral culture pattern. So I think the approach towards knowledge is also very different. And uh, that's where also this whole mismatch, I think that was quite complex. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, yeah. You know, statues of knowledge to ourselves. Dude, we make statues. Yeah. Have you not been? Okay. Listen to everything I'm saying. Sorry. My point, my point is, you know, and I don't, I don't really know much about Indian culture. I just, I know that there's a lot of differences between that kind of Western European and American concept, and there's, you know, there's a lot of other people with different views, and I think Wikipedia is a value to these other people, whether they no, but the problem is that it's not even that they don't see value. It's just two different knowledge structures completely. So when you then take something from a particular culture, from the US and try and implement it, which actually is what they did exactly, you know, that's why I was wondering whether you should actually set up a community because that really is like an artificial community because with open source communities, it's supposed to be organic, right? Like people come together and you don't know when it formed. But here it was literally like setting one up. So does that really work? It probably doesn't. Right. Oh. No, that's also, but then there's a lot of transparency issues there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was also skeptical about when I heard about it. Yeah. Although at the same time, it's very condescending when, for example, the Crafts Museum thing, they said, even the India community said, why are you bothering with the English Wikipedia, you know? So why I was saying the English aspiration is that when you go to uh, an urban engineering college in a city and say, do you want to contribute to Wikipedia in your native language? Hell no, I don't. Like, who cares, right? The approach towards native language is very different. You speak them at home, but you probably don't write and read in them. Because they have the kind of technical expertise which helps you start it. Not necessarily. I mean, there are a lot of people who you find, yeah, anyway. But. And it's not that we exclusively went there, but whenever we did land up in any city college, the, the first thing is that my comfort level is in English. So why are you asking me to go somewhere else and work that whole journey and come back? So, and, and then when, when this whole thing happened that they said, take your crafts museum project to the Hindi Wikipedia, you know, nobody notices, nobody will put your article down, nobody will delete it. So that's another channel, like if you say I'm going to build my own knowledge structure, you're caught with a bunch of underprivileged, yeah, rules and policies and people, yeah. Yeah, resentful, yeah. And um, I mean that, that, my initial reaction to that is that's probably an excellent. Everyone can call it the MPS of everyone else in their own community is doing their own thing for like, I don't know, 5, 20 or 25. And at least those communities can build their own things by themselves separately. Uh, but that obviously pretty incompatible with the idea that the one who can figure out that language will grow. No, 
see if I were to be really frank with you, I think that's the most horrible thing that could happen to any volunteer in the community is because you may become, say for example, I'm standing here and talking to you about this, but the people who I'm really supposed to be working with resent me or don't want to work with me. So I could either become a fetishized exotic object giving information about my country and what went wrong or I could be someone absolutely superior and doing my own thing and so it's if you want work done, that's never going to happen with that. Yeah. Part of how I feel though is that in in open source software, it's often possible to get a lot done in a two to twenty five, one to twenty five person team, where you can build an artifact that can interact with other people with those artifacts in the open source software. Um, but then we don't. There, in that sense, there isn't really an open source community. There's one open source community for that. Also, in that sense, I think Wikipedia differs from other projects is that because it has a lot of the human component so it, it does involve a lot of the social and the cultural and and you won't even probably have tech changes done until your community agrees to them and there's no such thing as single player wikipedia yeah well, no, there is. why i've seen there is a wikipedia in the philippines you know how to wikipedia okay and this is and the only contributor is a very active contributor he don't even know who he is and he's the only one who edits it you see the end of the street it's only him him, him, him. What is your No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just had I just had one last comment to make is because you started this is how I really thought that you know moving out from cinema and going towards this was letting was going to let me do my own thing like like being an introvert or you know working on my own but it really turned out exactly the opposite way the whole collaborative way so yeah. Thank you.